So now to conclude this lecture, what we're going to focus on is the brain, specifically the vertebrate brain. And what we've been noticing throughout this idea of the nervous system within complex organisms is a great amount of organization. The vertebrate brain is much the same way. And we're going to entitle this next flowchart the specialization of the vertebrate brain. So here what we're going to be focusing on is how the vertebrate brain has so many different portions and parts of it that are devoted to very specific actions that control the entire body. And that's going to be basically summarized by understanding the different specializations that are associated within the brain. So we have to understand before we look at the vertebrate brain as a whole, we have to understand it from an embryonic perspective because that's what starts the specialization. That's what allows the differentiation of this brain to occur in the way that it does. So let's begin by looking at vertebrate embryonic development. Now we've seen embryonic development before through our development lectures and we've mentioned the organogenesis of much of the central nervous system and the nervous system um, when we looked at the neural tube formation. This is shown in figure 49.11. It summarizes what we'll basically state um, about the vertebrate embryonic development. What we noticed uh, previously, and just to reiterate, is that the embryo develops a neural tube. That's the basic first step of this organogenesis. So the embryo develops a neural tube, and that's what you'll see in figure 49.11. But what happens afterwards, this neural tube becomes specialized. Two parts of the neural tube are going to become two major parts of the central nervous system. You're going to have the posterior end of, the central, of this neural tube become the spinal cord. That's what it's going to give rise to, this posterior part of the neural tube. Now, the other side of the neural tube, the anterior portion, will undergo cephalization. It will undergo a thickening at this anterior end to give you the other half of the central nervous system, and in focus in this flowchart would be the brain. So we get an anterior brain. This anterior brain contains three portions that we need to understand. This will include the forebrain, it will also include the midbrain, and embryonically there will also be a hindbrain portion. Each of these portions during embryonic development will eventually give rise to the following subcomponents within the brain. Take a look at how specialized and how organized the brain is upon embryonic development. The forebrain will contain two major parts within it, named the telencephalon and also it will contain the diencephalon. And we're just going to name the parts here. We won't specifically get into the functions just yet. That will be in a later flowchart. So the telencephalon and diencephalon are both part of the forebrain. The midbrain gives rise to eventually the mesencephalon. And the hindbrain also gives rise to two portions known as the metencephalon so there's a T here instead of an S, so be aware of that, the metencephalon and also the myencephalon. So we have these various different parts of the anterior brain within an embryonic um, development scheme that we see within vertebrates. So take a look at figure 49.11 to see this in a more visually uh, representative way. Now, what we're going to now look at through this understanding of what happens embryonically is a comparison of vertebrates over on this side of the flowchart. So let's do a comparison of vertebrates. We noticed before that the complexities of nervous systems depend on function, depend on lifestyle. The vertebrate brain is also going to follow that idea since it is a part of the nervous system. So what we notice when we compare different vertebrates is that the size of these three main regions that we just highlighted definitely varies. Size of three main regions, that is the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Those three main brain regions are going to vary depending on the organism in question, thus depending on the lifestyle of the organism as well. So let's take a look here. 
If we have, let's say, the forebrain, which is one of those major three parts of the brain, you're going to have something like an olfactory bulb, which is a subpart of the forebrain located here. The olfactory bulb is going to be the part of the brain that detects scents. So this may or may not be important, or more important, or less important, depending on the organism. We'll look at an example of this in just a second. The forebrain will also contain a very important part of the overall vertebrate brain, known as the cerebrum, which is in charge of complex mind processes. Complex processing and even learning as a whole is associated with the cerebrum, plus learning. So those are very much specialized processes, very much important processes of a central nervous system that are located and found within the cerebrum, which is within the forebrain. So that's what our forebrain is basically there for. What about the midbrain? We know that the midbrain gives rise to the mesencephalon, but what, generally speaking, is the midbrain useful for? The midbrain is important as a coordinator. It specifically coordinates sensory input. So some organisms may have tons and tons of sensory input that they need to understand. You would expect, therefore, that their midbrain size is going to vary dependent on how much sensory input they need to coordinate. And the same goes for the final part of the brain that we've talked about, the hindbrain. The hindbrain is mainly in charge for, it gives rise to, first of all, the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, therefore, later on, its size is directly correlated with the following. The cerebellum size is directly correlated with the complexity of muscle activity. So if an organism is doing very complex muscle movements, moving around a lot, catching prey maybe, those are complex muscle activities that will be represented by the size of their cerebellum. I think a good way to understand this idea of variation of size dependent on function is to look and ground this idea on an example. And a good example would be the ray-finned fish. Let's take a look here on the bottom. Example, ray-finned fish. So this is a vertebrate. It's a relatively complex animal. And what I'll give you a sort of a background on this organism is the following. This organism tends to explore. It likes to explore the environment by smelling. And that's with olfaction, if you want to say it in a more scientific way. This organism explores the environment with olfaction. It also relies heavily on vision to explore its environment and also utilizes what is known as a lateral line system. All you need to understand about the lateral line system is that this is a way for the ray fin fish to detect water currents electrical stimuli, its body position, those are very complex uh, coordination activities that are highlighted by its lateral line system. So let's see the outcomes of these different characteristics on the actual ray-finned fish brain. We notice that the ray-finned ray -finned fish has a relatively large olfactory bulb. Now why is that? What makes it have a large olfactory bulb? Well, that's because I told you here that it uses olfaction a lot to explore its environment. And when we say this term relatively, we're basically stating that based on the ray-finned fish's size, that's going to give us a relative large olfactory bulb. It's not that its olfactory bulb is, let's say, smaller or larger than an elephant. That's not relative to the ray-finned fish. You have to keep it relevant and um, related to the ray-finned fish by saying relatively large olfactory bulb. So it's based off of the ray-finned fish's own size. Its own brain, therefore, has a large olfactory bulb. Same thing can be said about this step, this part of its brain. It actually has a relatively small cerebrum. So we've mentioned the cerebrum. Take a look up here. Complex processing and learning. Therefore, we notice that the ray finned fish does not undergo any higher order thinking. It does not do problem solving or complex uh, understanding of its world. It does not involve itself in that and thus its size of that particular brain region will correlate with that function. So there's no higher order thinking within ray finned fish. So guess what? Small cerebrum. No necessary need for them to, for that part of the brain to be large. It will also have a relatively 
large midbrain. Let's take a look at what the midbrain is useful for. Coordinates sensory input. There's a lot of sensory input here. Olfaction, vision, this lateral line system is just a bunch of sensory detections that are happening. So the midbrain would obviously be large. And also, because this raven fish is swimming all around and detecting a lot of things within its environment, it's going to have, in addition, a relatively, based off of its size, a large hindbrain as well because of the complex muscle activity it has to undergo. That's the ray fin fish. It has these relatively large parts of the brain or small parts of the brain all based off of function. If you compare this let's say with birds or mammals like us, we actually have a relatively large forebrain. And why is that? Our relatively large forebrain based off of our body size birds and mammals as a whole is because birds and mammals are capable of complex cognition, of thinking, of understanding the environment and problem solving. And therefore we represent that by a large relative uh, forebrain, specifically a cerebrum. So that covers our look at the specialization of the vertebrate brain. Hopefully you get an idea of this correlation that we've seen here. In the next video, what we'll be focusing on is the specific part of the brain known as the cerebrum and highlighting why we have complex processing and learning in this part of the brain.